bio background. Uh, well, it was my father who founded uh, Fire Eater. At that time, uh, it is so approaching 50 years ago, it was founded based on uh, using Halon uh, 1301 for, for fire extinguishing. Uh, um, <clears throat> at that time, I, uh, I have been involved uh, when I was studying in, in high school, and, uh, even before. I was uh, involved, uh, you know, on, on free after school, uh, free time work. I was working on my in my father's company a little bit on, for example, the Halon filling station, filling Halon cylinders, and uh, I was helping my father with some uh, flow calculation uh, calculator that that uh, was were beginning to use at, at that time. So I was involved in fight. I knew about the business and the, the area of, uh, of the fire extinguishing systems. Uh, um, but I had my own business at that time. I was doing uh, windsurfing and I was a semi-pro windsurfer myself. So I was uh, building a business around that. Um, but uh, in, in the early 80s, I was um, you know, beginning to come to the point where Yes, this windsurfing business that was um, that was that was very funny, but it was also uh, uh, not so serious in a way. So, um, so I, I was I was uh, getting into my my father's uh, company, and I started up uh, uh, this uh, let's say export business in um, in south of Europe uh, and in the Middle East, selling Halon systems. Uh, from Fire Eater. Uh, so Fire Eater was doing Halon. I was selling Halon uh, systems to distributors in uh, south of Europe, uh, a lot in Portugal and uh, also in, uh, in, the, in the Middle East. Uh, so my traveling in the Middle East took me to Iran. Um, uh, and I was uh, invited to do a, a full-scale test at the uh, uh, NIOC, the National Iranian Oil Company uh, refinery uh, south of uh, Tehran. Uh, and I did a very, very uh, nice and successful full-scale test. But when we did the full-scale test with Halon, it was always just with like uh, candles or oil lamps or something, very, very small fire. And uh, I made this full scale test and then there was an evaluation afterwards. And and the, the, the leader of the team at the, at the refinery, he was uh, telling me, yeah, Mr. Lawson, it's, it's fine, but I do not need a big expensive Halon system to extinguish a tiny little candle or an oil lamp. Uh, I would like to see a real fire. Uh, so we agreed to actually, uh, and he demanded or requested that uh, the fire should be uh, um, uh, 50 by 50 centimeter oil pan fire, uh, oil and gasoline uh, mixture to make a real fire that uh, that was not easy to just blow out uh, like you can the candle. Um, so, uh, and I was in those at that time, I was a little bit unsecure if this was uh, really wise to do, because when you have a larger fire, uh, the chemical fire extinguishing agent, it will it will have a lot of uh, decomposition, uh, some toxic and corrosive uh, uh, chemicals that come out of the breaking of the molecule of the chemical uh, fire extinguishing agent. So I contacted the the expert uh, of our suppliers of Halon. It was Atokem and it was uh, Dupont, and uh, they recommended, yeah, this is fine. Uh, you can you can do that. Uh, uh, you just need to have uh, good enough uh, concentration, uh, better six percent than five percent, and do not have uh, too long discharge time because, um, uh, yeah, everybody knows that longer the discharge time, the more the uh, breakdown products you you get from from the extinguishing. So. I designed a, a, a system for demonstration, which was controlled by a, a very sensitive flame detector. 
I did 7% concentration um, and five seconds uh, discharge, which, which is very, very fast. So you get a very fast extinguishing with it. And therefore you should minimize the amount of decomposition uh, to uh, a, a quite small uh, and, and, uh, and uh, level that is not uh, unsafe. Uh, that, that was confirmed by these um, so-called technical experts from, from, from the chemical suppliers. So, I actually made the full-scale test um, and uh, we were, I think, nine people inside the room. Um, and then uh, uh, when you discharge a halon system, there will be some clouding because of the temperature drop, so that there will be uh, the, 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 no visibility for some one or two minutes depending a little bit on the moisture uh, level, uh, but, but uh, typically one to two minutes there is, uh, you're going to see anything and then it clears up and you can then uh, see something. So the guy, he throws the, the match on, the, on the, the fire pan and the, immediately the fire goes <laughs> um, And without any delay, it is detected, the halon is discharged. And I have this feeling that Yes, this is going to be a fantastic success, uh, success and, and, and I'm going to sell a lot of halon to these guys because this worked just fantastic. And that is until I take the first breath, um, because it is not possible to breathe inside that, uh, that atmosphere. Uh, people are yelling and screaming and uh, I uh, shout that you have to leave the room. Uh, and then I, I have, at uh, that time I was uh, also having a firefighter education uh, and uh, I'm going on, on the floor or, uh, and, and, and then I searched that there are nobody uh, in the room but uh, there's one guy, he had been running straight into the, into the wall, he had a big bruise, um, he's unconscious, I pull him out, uh, outside the other eight guys, uh, seven guys, they are on the ground coughing and crying and um, it is like uh, Dante's Inferno. It's uh, it, and it, it's in the time of Ayatollah Khomeini. And uh, every time when, when I move around at the, t at the refinery, there's always two young guys with machine guns following me to see uh, that I'm not making any uh, uh, mess up. And uh, so, so it was a very tense situation, I would say. Uh, Nobody is killed, but uh, it was really, really um, a bad experience. Um, because of the decomposition, it is uh, typically uh, hydrogen bromine, HBr, and it's hydrogen uh, fluoride, fluoride, which is uh, uh, hydrofluoric acid. And uh, when you breathe that, it's, uh, it's very harmful and you can get lung edema. Uh, so, so you have water in your lungs after uh, breathing it. Um, and and uh, so it's, it's serious. Fortunately, we got out uh, very, very uh, quickly, but um, uh, but, but it was a bad, bad experience, uh, I would say. Uh, I, I was managing not to be arrested and I managed to get out of Iran and go back home. Uh, and about a month Later, after this, I, I was also educating uh, fire chiefs at the Copenhagen uh, uh, Fire Chief School and uh, educating them in uh, in uh, fixed fire extinguishing systems so that uh, they, they knew about uh, like halon systems, CO2 systems and, and so on. Um, at the time I'm doing this lecture, one month after, I'm still having like a peeling skin, uh, still coughing a little bit because of the chemical burns from, 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 the, from the halon exposure and the, and the decomposition products. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's not something to play with, but um, I have this presentation for, for these uh, guys, uh, this class, and, uh, and uh, in those days it's a you know, typical uh, presentation with printed slides that you do, so you don't change your PowerPoint like you do today if you have some little change you want to do. So I was doing basically my standard presentation, and the standard presentation was covering uh, the use of uh, inerting with, for example, nitrogen, 
uh, explain to them what what is the problem, uh, what are the issues with that, and then uh, explaining about carbon dioxide, what are the issues issues and problems around that, and then uh, about Halon, what are all the fantastic, uh, beautiful things about Halon. So that was the standard presentation. So I gave this presentation. Um, and I talked about uh, nitrogen and uh, giving the basics about how nitrogen works by, uh, by, by minimizing, by lowering the oxygen concentration to a level where, where the fire cannot uh, continue. And that's typically uh, between 10 to 13 percent oxygen. But, uh, but when you are getting down at that level, uh, the problem is that, that, that the body does not get enough fuel. The oxygen is needed for particularly the brain and the, and the heart muscle. Um, and when you get too little fuel, you also produce too little um, of, of the exhaust gases. And when, when you have the combustion in the body, the exhaust gas is actually carbon dioxide. So, and, and carbon dioxide, it has a, phys, a, a physiological stimulation. It, it stimulates your breathing. The more carbon dioxide you breathe or you have in your blood, bloodstream, the, it increases your respiration. Um, and I used for the first time, uh, I, 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 by coincidence, I, I used the term that the, that the, the, the real issue with nitrogen alone, it, it is actually, uh, or using nitrogen, is that the physiological stimulation gets too little. Then I tell about carbon dioxide. And then, uh, you know, when everybody knows that when you have a carbon dioxide system, uh, they think carbon dioxide is toxic, but it is actually not really toxic because it is always naturally in our our bloodstream, in our physiology. We breathe oxygen, we produce carbon dioxide, and so so it's a natural component of our physiology. So therefore, you cannot say it's toxic. But when the concentration gets too high, then you get into a respiratory shock condition. There are some chemical aspects and so on, but but. Generally, you get into this respiratory shock condition, and uh, then you stop breathing, and then you die. So, so that's the mechanism. And I used the the again the the language that um, that with carbon dioxide, the physiological effect is too strong. And just before I used the that that for nitrogen, it was too little. And then I got this thought that. I just said nitrogen was too weak, the physiological uh, effect becomes too weak, and with CO2 it becomes too strong. So what if you take some carbon dioxide and add to, for example, nitrogen to counter, to, to eliminate the, the, the lack of physio physiological effect with a little bit of carbon dioxide? Could work. That could work. I got this thought in my head, and so you asked me one of your questions: What was your your moment? And that uh, was actually it. I just in the middle of the presentation got this idea uh, in the background while I was doing the presentation. Then I talked about H uh, Halon. I talked about Halon, typical uh, like like I always did. But at the end, I said yes. But be aware that Halon, if you have a uh, more than just a little fire, then it can become very dangerous. So I, I modified my presentation a little bit with latest experience. So uh, uh, and it was on a Friday this uh, lecture I gave, and uh, then on the Saturday in the morning I went to the to the to the, to the factory to the office. Um, we had like a small paint booth. Uh, I took uh, an empty Halon cylinder, filled a blend with nitrogen and a little bit of carbon dioxide. So it was almost the same proportion uh, as we're using today. Uh, a little, possibly a little more carbon dioxide than we're using today, but something like that, about 10%. It was not that precise, but, but about 10% carbon dioxide in the blend with nitrogen. Um, I make a fire in the in the room uh, with some uh, some uh, ethanol alcohol. Uh, a good fire, a pretty good fire, uh, maybe uh, 25 centimeters uh, diameter. Uh, with that, you could not do it with with halon. It would be the same as in the in the Iran uh, catastrophe. Um, but uh, then I stand in there alone, alone. That's really crazy. But I, I do it alone. I calculated the, what, whatever concentration I expected to be. Um, I noticed the fire is extinguished. I noticed that I have this um, 
expected effect of some increased breathing. I stay there for, I think, maybe 15 minutes, 20 minutes. Uh, absolutely perfect. No um, visual uh, troubles like uh, tunnel vision, which is normal when you have too little oxygen. Uh, no uh, difficulty with color discrimination. Uh, everything was fine. No sensation of fainting or headache or anything which is normal for, for, for when you reduce the, the oxygen concentration to, for example, 15%. So I was like, it really works. I knew a lot of the basics, and you also asked the question if I, if uh, my my uh, this uh, invention idea it had any relation to my scuba diving because it's correct that I, I was scuba diving, and of course it gave me a little bit of insight in some of the physiology, uh, but um, but uh, it was actually not uh, related to the to to, to that part. Uh, uh, well, the scuba diving just had made me a little more. A little curious, so so I had been studying a little bit about the, let's say the the the, the details of different gases when you breathe uh, different gases. But uh, when you are not a doctor and you read all these medical studies and uh, uh, theories and so on, it's uh, it's complicated and it's uh, not accessible uh, for for people who have not got the, the let's say the medical scientific uh, background. But uh, but uh, by I had uh, been studying a little more, and that was also why I was giving a little deep, deeper lecture on on the extinguishing systems on uh, for these fire chiefs. So after that, I. Um, I repeated the experiments a couple of times, um, and then uh, I was getting very curious, curious about the organic chemistry, which is relevant for the chemical fire extinguishing agents. I was getting very curious about the human uh, physiology, the respiratory physiology, the uh, the things that would necessary to, to, to know and understand this to, to, to really uh, do it fully so I was I was studying a lot uh, and it, it, it was not on Google at that time it was uh, going into the library of the coming uh, University Hospital and, um, and and finding studies and uh, reading them uh, uh, in, in, in the library and in a silent, silent corner and <laughs> it was uh, it was other days uh, that time but but never nevertheless uh, I was studying and reading uh, a lot of lit literature about um, about this issue. I was a little bit uh, in doubt, uh, honestly, that uh, it, this seems to be such a, uh, an amazing idea. But just why? Why was it not uh, done before? It was a in, in, for some time it was a little bit of a barrier to me so I was also converting that into a lot of uh, studying to get the in-depth understanding about this um, uh, and uh, the, the, the Iran incident and my Eureka moment that would have been uh, in 1985 um, where I would be some 28 years old from the 1957, so so something in, in, in that neighborhood, um, and uh, then I, I studied a lot, uh, and finally in uh, 1987, I decided to 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 write a patent application for the idea. Uh, then I had been doing some patent works earlier, but. Um, and I had been doing it with a with a patent patent agent, and uh, I didn't have very good experience with that. So I spent a lot of time studying about how to do a patent application and and so on. And uh, finally, I made my patent application. Uh, then there are a lot of formalities, and there's a new study of the patent application. And about nine, ten months after your your application, then you get the response about the news um, and so on, uh, and, and also the. Uh, if the patent uh, application is uh, having enough patent hide and the idea is good enough for patent and and that there is no uh, conflicting uh, patents uh, so on 
and I was reading, and you get you get like uh, I think five or six hundred pages of the other other patterns and and so on. And I was going through, and the, and the review was very good. That uh, it, it was um, it was everything was, was fine, uh, except uh, they had just discovered that uh, there was a patent application in the United States made by Air Products and Chemicals, uh, Lambert and, and San Angelo, that was uh, virtually similar. Uh, with, with the principles and, and so on, so so that was a, a really that, that uh, really awful. That we get this this experience, this uh, response that yes, everything is good except somebody else did the same nine days before my patent applications. So they filed their patent applications application nine days before I filed mine. Whereby they would have pro a possibility to have priority, so that um, yeah, good idea. But somebody got it uh, before me. Well, <laughs> I, I spent a, a little time being being uh, in a bad mood and um, and uh, thinking. Wow, this could have been fantastic, but now it's not. But uh, after a couple of weeks of being sour, I was like, uh, "No, damn! I'm going to I'm going to contact these guys uh, because uh, who knows? Maybe maybe we should fight each other, but maybe we should all not fight. And maybe we should work together. It could be uh, a possibility." And. Then I got like a lot of difficulties getting in contact with air products and chemicals. I was writing uh, telexes and faxes and uh, letters and uh, never got any response. And uh, uh, but but then I found out that by by some friends in the United States that um, that Joseph Sant'Angelo, one of the inventors uh, of the American uh, patent, he was. Uh, he was actually uh, the, the leader of the air products and chemicals product development uh, department. Uh, and uh, I, I was writing to the secretary and, and uh, then at the end, I, I never got any responses. So I, I wrote uh, a telex and a letter saying that, uh, you know, uh, in three weeks I will, I will visit, uh, I will be arriving in the United States and then I will stay outside your 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 office and I will not go home until we, we have a have a meeting and talk about this. Then I got a response from Joe uh, that uh, yeah okay sorry we have not responded but I'm I, I, I would I would, I would uh, like to welcome you and uh, and so on and, uh, and then it was it was great I was arriving there and uh, he even invited me out for for dinner the day before our meeting and uh, so so. Uh, and then I got to the to the meet. By the way, Air Products and Chemicals was slightly larger than Fire. We were about uh, 16, 18 employees at that time. A small company, uh, and uh, Air Products and Chemicals, very large company. The the product development and research department that was six hundred people working in the headquarters only. So so uh, it was um, very small uh, Fire Eater and very very big uh, Air Products and, and Chemicals. Um, I, I got to the meeting and uh, and uh, Joe, he said to me I was going to meet a guy called Chris, uh, his friend, uh, and uh, so I, I was, uh, I was uh, yeah, com coming to the meeting and, uh, and Chris was there and Joe was there and uh, and uh, yeah, we started the meeting, and uh, I was explaining uh, uh, my my background. Uh, they, they they were asking questions. What what uh, what uh, did, what was my invention about? And uh, yeah, was uh, reducing oxygen with some inert gas, and then adding carbon dioxide to make it safe. Uh, so, uh, and then uh, Chris he started to ask uh, questions. Uh, you know, more detailed uh, medical, technical kind of questions, and I was, uh, I think I was quite good uh, answering those questions. Uh, and 
Then Chrissy asked me, but what, your, what is your background? Is it, are you a medical doctor or a phys- physiologist or what? what are, no, no, but I've been studying a lot. And then Chrissy replied, yeah, but it's not so easy to, to study that part of the, the human physiology. So uh, how, how could you do that? And then I told you the same as I told you before, that I went to the university library and I was reading all kinds of uh, things. Uh, and yes, I had, to, I had to admit that it was not easy. Um, there was a lot of terms and background and, and so on. So when you're reading one study, it was like uh, you, you would understand half of it, but um, it didn't make much sense. So, but then I, I said, yeah, but then I found this book um, called uh, Respiration. The title is Respiration. And that was, that was my second Eureka moment because that book, when I was reading that book, it was also complicated, but it was putting everything into perspective for me and uh, I read this book by Christian J. Lambertson uh, it was really fantastic uh, for me because that was uh, after a long study it was, it was giving me all the let's say the full understanding and uh, uh, a great insight in, in all this even though that I was not a, a, a physiologist so and then uh, Chris he asked me but do you know this guy, Christian James Le- uh, J- James Lambertson, that's actually me. So so Chris was just Christian Lambertson. So so, and of course from that point it was like uh, we we became quite good friends. I um, I think he liked that I mentioned his book as the one that, that actually was was giving me the bridge into into this uh, difficult uh, area. Uh, and Chris and I, we became uh, lifelong friends. He has passed away now, but uh, he was an old guy. Uh, he was more than 90 when he passed. So, um, uh, but but uh, we had a, a, a great or created a great uh, relationship. He became like almost like a second father to me and uh, or, or me, uh, 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 a kind of an extra son. Uh, so so we, we had this uh, great relationship. And I had um, over the, the years, we had so much uh, let's say good times uh, together. Uh, so, um, so actually, at this meeting, um, we agreed that uh, we're going to we should find a way to work together because they had been. You know, then this story would then jump to how did they come up with this? Chris and Joe, they were also personal friends, and, and Chris was at a dinner with Joe, and uh, they, I think they shared a couple, a bottle of red wine, or maybe two. And then um, Joe, he was like uh, saying he had been discovering all this about Halon becoming uh, obsolete and environmentally benign and damaging. And uh, uh, so, so why could we not use any of, uh, let's say, air product and chemical normal industrial gases for the, for the purpose? And, and Chris's immediate response was, yeah, we, you can use uh, nitrogen or any other inert gas and then the little bit of carbon dioxide that, that will make it safe. And okay, so they, Put it to the to the technical uh, the no no not the technical the law department the legal department of, of APNs uh, air products and chemicals they they had a legal department a big one where 60 of the attorneys they were only working with pat- patent matters so they just put this technical let's say thing in uh, to these people and then they were writing the patent application and I think it was done two or three weeks after after the um, the dinner between uh, Joe and Chris. Therefore, they beat me by, by, by nine days. <laughs> so, um, and then came a long period where we were drafting and negotiating agreements uh, between um, uh, air products and chemicals and, and, and fire eater and um, actually air products and chemicals they had assigned the worldwide exclusive license and rights to Energen uh, to to a, a company or a, yeah it was a company called Ecosystems. Uh, it's, uh, it was a, a company that Chris founded 
um, and it was working in uh, in the university where where Chris he had uh, uh, let's say a faculty of uh, environmental medicine and, and uh, this company was uh, founded to generate money for the research and, and so on. So air products and chemicals is let's say a reward or honor gave this to Chris because Chris he was in the board of directors of air products and chemicals and he had been helping them a lot on te technical um, uh, matters and with the uh, environmental uh, environmental medicine uh, aspect uh, he had been doing a lot of work for, for air products so, um, so they gave him this so I was at the end I was doing the agreement with, uh, between Pfizer and Ecosystems. It was, it was an agreement covering uh, Europe where I got the exclusive, uh, or Pfizer got the exclusive uh, license. Uh, it was given to me personally, but, but I was doing it with, with, with Pfizer. So, um, um, <clears throat> yeah, we, we signed this agreement and uh, it was done. It took a long time. Uh, we were I think we were signing it in 1989 or something like that. Um, but before we did, uh, and before I met uh, Chris and Joe, they had been uh, they had been contacting, let's say, the American big companies doing uh, uh, such high thinking systems like uh, like Ansel, uh, Chematron, and uh, uh, a few others, and. Um, and uh, when they presented this idea of which became Inogen to, to, to them, they were just like, it's interesting, but it's absolutely not practical. We are never going to do something like that. Um, so, so therefore, Chris and Joe, they were motivated to, because I was telling them, this is a great idea. We know what, I know how to make this uh, practical and feasible in the, in the market. and. Uh, so then they, they gave me the exclusive license for Europe. I hope to get more. I, I hope to get the rest of the world. But but I can fight with 16 employees. That was, was maybe not the strongest vehicle for 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 this project. So but it, it, it was not so bad. I got the uh, Europe. Uh, the royalties that that I could uh, uh, generate, they were going to be shared between me and um, and ecosystems. On, 30% to me and 70% to ecosystems. Uh, but again, it's better than nothing. And uh, so, so uh, and that, that, that actually started the whole thing. And in that we did the first uh, pilot installations. We did them in, uh, in 1989, 1990. Uh, we, we did a system in the in a fertilizer factory in Denmark, where we uh, protected uh, some switchgear and electrical uh, uh, high tension room and, and, and so on. Uh, we also did uh, uh, technical rooms and some uh, brewers, and we, we did uh, also uh, a few other installations in small computer rooms. Uh, so, so uh, we were actually switching over from. Then from from Halen to to uh, to Inogen. Inogen was was my um, uh, name for the for the child. I did the, the trademark registration in Denmark, the first one, uh, a little bit later. But uh, we found that Inogen was was a uh, was a good uh, good name for it, and uh, then that became the trade trademark for this uh, patented uh, idea. Um, then uh, I was working in the, in the trade union in Denmark, a trade organization, uh, and uh, of course I was bragging about the, that we had found something that was replacing Halon, and uh, we were already doing installations and uh, to, to my colleagues. And uh, yeah, if you want to have a, a license, then you should. Uh, you should uh, uh, Ask politely, then we can make an agreement. So, um, uh, 
and and one of the the, the other people who was sitting in this trade organization was, uh, was a guy who was a CEO for Wormel in Denmark, and um, uh, actually the 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 logo of the Mozanica is is looking like and uh, turned turned around the Wormel logo. Uh, I think it's intentional and it looks good. <laughs> so. Um, and he was participating shortly after this. Uh, he was participating in a, in a European manager meeting for Tycho uh, Wormald in uh, Europe. And he was uh, just reporting at this meeting that there was this uh, crazy little company fire that they, they came to have found a solution for, for a Halon replacement. And, uh, and then uh, um, he came back and asked me if I was uh, okay to set up meetings with, with people from uh, from, uh, from 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 uh, the cycle company Total uh, Walder in Germany because they had uh, let's say a research uh, department and, and, and the people working with something like this and um, they they uh, came up and, and to us and uh, we I made full scale tests with them demonstrating how it works and. Uh, Explain the principles and uh, and uh, everything, and uh, they reported back to the management that yes, this was really, really interesting. Uh, uh, it seemed to be the, the solution, and uh, the, I was also in contact. Uh, I was working in the European uh, trade organization, the Eurofa, uh, where I met people from, from Kipling, and I met people from Siemens, and, and many others, they were all interested. But of all the candidates for a corporation, um, uh, Kipling, Siemens, they said, yeah, but we will also do uh, uh, HFC gas uh, solutions, so the new chemicals that are coming up, but we are also interested for, for your energy, but, uh, but we will be free to do all of it where the Tyco management, they said, this is a really, really, uh, that would be a very strong market position to have and concentrate on something which is a real clean agent, which is not having any environmental issues, which is so safe, which has no breakdown products and fire extinguishing. Uh, it is, it is, is a perfect solution. So we will make an agreement where we do not do anything else than energy, and we will focus 100% on that. In Germany, they were doing also carbon dioxide systems, but that, that was cool. Uh, our main issue, my main issue was the chemicals, but because after the after the incident in Iran, I was also, as I said to you, I was studying uh, organic chemistry a lot, because I was really curious to, to find out what it, what it was really all about. And, and in all this studying, I actually realized that these fluorinated gases, even halon is fluorinated gas, and then there was HFCs, that's also fluorinated gases, and all these fluorinated gases, they, they it is completely unpredictable how they, and, and, but, but it's certain that they will have a lot of um, bad effects. So I was actually taking the decision I had taken over the management of fire a little bit earlier uh, from my father, and I decided that we, we wanted in fire either to phase out Halon immediately, switch over to Inogen and not do any of the, the chemical extinguishing agents. And Tycho going in with the same approach uh, that make like a, a very good uh, bond and, and, uh, and uh, we established a extremely close cooperation with Tycho. I think we signed the agreements with them during 1991 and 92. Uh, so Tyco got uh, exclusive agreement in the major European uh, countries, uh, license agreement with, with I or myself. Well, uh, and and then uh, we kept some of the let's say Scandinavian uh, countries and uh, Eastern Europe. We, we kept that. Uh, Open. Tyco had access, but, but we, we also could uh, uh, make agreements with, with other other companies. So, so that was um, great, and, and, and Energen became very, very successful during the, the 90s. Uh, and played a, a big role in, let's say, a lot of countries uh, in Europe. Uh, uh, 
I was uh, in the position and the agreement I made with uh, with the ecosystems. Um, it was there, there was some pretty optimistic uh, predictions on how much market we could generate. We generated a lot of market, but it was not really getting to the top. Of the, but, but but that was cool. We are, uh, we we adjusted that. But I. I was not in a position where I could claim that I would also take over the rest of the world. So, so uh, I eventually recommended that uh, ecosystems for United States uh, signed up with uh, Ansel, which was belonging to a Tyco company, so that it remained Tyco and uh, so that it did, did not dilute uh, by by going out as well. So it was basically the same concept. Um, and then uh, Chris, he agreed with Ansel, and they were also very successful that uh, Ansel got the rest of the world outside Europe. Uh, so, so I, I had uh, Europe, and um, and then during the 90s, I developed, uh, let's say, high-pressure systems, and in the beginning we were using uh, low pressure big tanks and uh, it was very clumsy and very difficult to work with but uh, then we moved over to high pressure and we were the first in the, in the market with 200 bar and then blah 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 in 1997 we went to 300 bar so we made very very uh, efficient uh, systems and then uh, just after 2002 uh, that, that became a lot of that, a lot of competition was coming into the European market, and some of the Tyco companies they were they were suffering a little bit because they were using the Tyco Total Water hardware. They had a lot of difficulties with it, and then they found out that I had a very good package with, with high pressure, and they went over to that. So one of the key issues with with, with Inogen and other inert gases is to to have like a high storage pre pressure so that you can have a smaller system, uh, less cylinders. <clears throat> To, to get back to the Inogen uh, history, the patent expired by 2007-8. Uh, it has a maximum life of 20 years, so after that time, uh, other people could do what is now called IG-541, uh, the technical term. Uh, and uh, Tyco and Faida uh, are using the trademark Inogen, and then we, our customers can also, like Mosanica, can also say we are selling Inogen system, but it has to be Faida Inogen system. So, so it has to be tied to to Faida and uh, and to Tyco. So we saw, uh, let's say, a. Uh, when you talk about the market and the competition, um, in the 90s we had a lot of uh, quarrels with uh, other inert gases. Uh, there was a lot of arguing, if, is, is it really uh, positive or negative to have carbon dioxide in the blend and all the others who could not use carbon dioxide because of the patent, uh, like the, the argonite and so on, which came that it, had one that, that it was, you know, yeah. Really stupid to to have a health risk by lowering the the oxygen and then have even more health risk by adding carbon dioxide. Uh, that that was their argument, and we found that that in the market, a lot of the customers they were getting confused. That there was so much discussion between the inert gas suppliers. We said that yes, energy is safe and the safest is much better because it has have this uh, safety and it is the reality that it is much safer it's very safe it's, uh, it's really good it's, it's really really safe where with the other inert gases with our carbon dioxide if you, if you have an extinguishing con uh, this uh, concentration that goes down to 11 percent oxygen if people stay in there they, 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 they will have a lack of oxygen hypoxia which is not so good for their health so so that's not not happening with, with energy so th there was a lot of discussion and that gave a lot of uh, let's say tailwind for the for the chemicals uh, but after the patent expired, that the discussion disappeared. Now, now I think everybody agree that Inogen has advantages because uh, it is documented that it is 
for biting uh, a situation where even though you have a, have a very low oxygen concentration, for example, 10% oxygen, uh, with 4% carbon dioxide, you will have more oxygen available to the brain and the heart muscles, heart muscle, than you have when you breathe the normal 21% that we have in the normal atmosphere. You will have more oxygen available. 10, about 10% more oxygen available. So therefore, inogen is extremely safe. Um, so, so, but, but the discussion disappeared. And then um, on the other hand, we, we saw that there a lot of discussion has, uh, has now, is now happening between uh, some of the chemical manufacturers. And then uh, the situation has turned around and, and we, we, we see a lot of uh, positive movements for for inogen is like uh, in many places it's like uh, almost wow inogen is fantastic it's a, almost like a new thing people almost forgot about it and then now it's like uh, reinvented we have just just made some some uh, let's say uh, uh, winning new new grounds by for example using Inogen outside the normal applications for inogen. Uh, because normal applications, that's a server room, the technical room, the switchgear room, uh, in, in the power plant, in the airport, in the oil uh, industry, in the, uh, yeah, things like that. Now we are using it for, um, for warehouses, uh, chemical warehouses, uh, food logistics, uh, uh, cold stores like uh, where we have uh, huge deep freezers for food storage, uh, uh, pharmaceutical uh, warehouses, pharmaceutical processes. Uh, we even use it for national heritage like castles and theater and uh, archives a lot. Um, and and now we are looking into you're using it in uh, nursing homes uh, for elderly people. Uh, we are looking at the so we have uh, psychiatric institutions uh, where inogen is used to protect uh, people in a uh, let's say uh, closed psychiatric uh, ward. Um, we are it's not happened yet, but but also prisons they have uh, some issues with um, escape routes because people cannot uh, escape from the, from from their apartments there. The, the door is locked. Door is locked from the outside. So so um, and and if you take a look historically on prison riots, what they often do is that they ignite a fire and then uh, wait for, for, let's say, an evacuation uh, process to go on. And there in it, and it's fantastic because they can, you do not need to evacuate. You can just extinguish the fire and then uh, it is extinguished very, very early in the process. And even the guy who put things on uh, fire in the cell, you can wait until it has calmed down and uh, maybe it's coughing a little bit because of the smoke he created, but you can extinguish it and uh, it will not go any further. So therefore, it's, uh, it's a beautiful one. So we are opening up uh, the use of energy for a lot of new applications, even where water sprinkler was, uh, was used before. We also see in the marine environment where we are working, also together with Mazanica, um, that uh, by 2003, Inogen was, uh, up to 2003, 4, Inogen was quite strong in the marine environment. But then uh, there was an IMO decision to have a water mist system, local water mist system in, uh, on the engines in an uh, engine room. And then the water mist suppliers, they developed um, a total flooding system where you protect all the, the engine room with, with it. And that kind of took over. Now we see it switching back to uh, the beginning to switch back to inogen because the experience from water mist is not very good. Um, where the experience with inogen has always been very good, uh, also for efficiency and uh, safety and so on. So that was that was the, the brief story. So uh, this part of the, let's say inogen history, inogen is gaining strength, um, and we see that. Just recently, there has been coming for the chemicals. Now, actually, the the world has has discovered that that these fluorinated chemicals are actually very bad. They belong to a group of chemical called PFAS. And if you Google it, you can see that there is a lot of focus on PFAS. You know, it started with ozone depletion with halon, then it became global warming, and now it is PFAS. 
I did presentations more than 30 years ago where I predicted this and said, wait and see. It, it was ozone depletion, it will become global warming, but after global warming, it will be toxic environmental issues with the fluorinated chemicals. Uh, and everybody, many people believe fluor to be because if you read on your toothpaste, it's, that's fluor in uh, toothpaste. It's good for your teeth to have fluor. It's um, fluorine. Uh, but it's not uh, organic fluorine. It's natrium fluorine. And it's completely different. When you make, make fluorine organic, then it can travel into a lot of other chemical processes where it does a lot of damage. So that is what PFAS is, is all about. So, <laughs> that was a very concentrated um, uh, story. I think I, uh, I, I, I just scratched the surface, but, uh, but I think that, that's giving the, the, the big picture of, uh, of the uh, energy and history. Il sottoscritto che si trovò come consulente a fare l'analisi eh, dell'applicazione e dei costi che potevano derivare dall'utilizzo degli alon che allora erano stati messi all'indice, quando ehm, si venne a capire l'impatto che potevano avere lo smaltimento di questi gas che prima venivano rilasciati magari in atmosfera, i costi e la gestione di quella che era la sicurezza delle persone all'interno degli ambienti protetti eh, fu una scelta, quella che ponemmo in campo, che fu vincente perché dal 92 fummo tra i primi ad usare i gas inerti prima che arrivassero altri gas e passarono 5-6 anni e nel momento in cui sul mercato si presentò l'estinguente innovativo che era l'Inergen, quindi il Clean Agent, eh, che andava a sostituire gli Alon, fu un prodotto immediatamente eh, delineante di quello che sarebbe stato il futuro senza i gas chimici. Noi avevamo maturata una competenza tale che questo rapporto tra noi Wormal, poi divenuta Taiko, fu così eh, forte che fummo l'unico distributore che poteva progettare il sistema. Questa scelta ci mise nelle condizioni sempre di andare ad individuare quale fosse l'elemento migliore e meno dannoso per la protezione. Quindi in tutti i modi abbiamo cercato di dare un percorso che tenesse sempre presente la sicurezza delle persone, la sicurezza dell'ambiente, perché così è un aiuto per poter mantenere pulito anche il nostro settore, il settore antincendio.